Hello, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunrise Daily. Today, I'm trembling. So, can you believe it's Friday already? Oh, did you already feel Friday-ish before now? Well, whatever the situation is, thank God it's Friday. Good morning and welcome. I'm Maupe. Maupe, open yourself. Well, we just ended the weekend. Today is supposed to be some kind of Monday. But hey, it's Friday. Good morning and welcome. I'm Ayo Makinde. Yes, indeed. I mean, many might still be in that mood, uh, which they have been for how many? Two, three days now. So it's a Friday for lots of people. So why not just go ahead and uh, go to this one of these areas, uh, if you will, 28 degrees centigrade here in Abuja, the humidity is just about 72 percent. So you could, yeah, take another walk down some of these areas away from maybe the um, hustle and bustle of city life. If you want to calm your head away from all of the shenanigans that happens in town, if you want to escape traffic, VIO, FRSC, any one of them, I don't think they'll be here. Yeah, they certainly wouldn't be, Chamberlain, but the question now is how do you get the fuel to get there? Is that <laughs> right? <laughs> because there's a bit of scarcity right now in the Federal Capital Territory. It's unclear what is happening, but hey, if you have a full tank and you can make the journey, why not? This certainly will make it worth your while. Take a look at that view. I mean, it, I'm already feeling very relaxed just taking a look at that. Look at that. And you know the thing I lo love about Jurassic. April? Yes, Ooh. the thing I love about it's so therapeutic. That is Nigeria, by the way. It is Nigeria. It is right here in the Federal Capital Territory. A very therapeutic view uh, of the Usuma Dam we're seeing right there. One mm. of the things I love about the Federal Capital Territory is the fact that in April, mm. um, you know, just when the rain starts to come, Views like this become even more beautiful. Um, I, I can't there. tell about yes. It's March. This is April. Shame oh, me. we're in April. Why did you just say this <laughs> I, is April? I just said it's April. April. I said it's going to come tomorrow. <laughs> you just <laughs> wish me. That? You wish me a happy birthday this month. So yes, it's April. Oh, <laughs> Never mind the fact that it's my birth month as well. But hey, it is beautiful. I. Uh, what do you think? Is this something you'll be willing to travel down to Abuja to see? Well, I'm very sure that there are some, if, even if there are not dams or lakes, there are other views that you both have enjoyed in Lagos before you went to Abuja. So don't come at me with that one, but most certainly a view to celebrate. I mean, one of the things that I see when I, when I look at views like that is the number of movies that can be made from such. I mean, just imagine you want to create a movie scene right where you are right there. It, it's definitely something. Um, you know, it's some some tremendous and uh, an amazing view. And I like what you said there, Chamberlain. It is Nigeria. Some people don't believe that there are amazing sites in Nigeria. I saw one view somewhere in Kiduna State. Some Nigerian movie maker went and took the shot. If you saw that view, believe me, you would think it's somewhere in China. But it is here in Nigeria, in Kiduna State, as a matter of fact. Well, you know, um, Chamberlain and Malkoy, sometimes when as newsmen, people must wonder how we deal with it. We have to talk about happy times and then we have to talk about unfortunate incidences at the same time. And this is something that can be very, very trying. Take the Dosumo fire um, um, situation, for example. The, the governor was there yesterday and look at it. The devastation is... <sighs> I, I don't know what to make of it. The, the fire affected both sides of one street. The governor has been there and he has promised that they're going to demolish houses that contravene the regulations of the state. It has also been declared that there will be no trading on that uh, street for now and um, that anyone who has violated the state uh, regulations, they will definitely meet their Waterloo one way or the other. We understand that the Lagos State Government has also put out notice that one person has been reported dead and eight people injured in the fire incidents you know, that took place here. But, um, Mark, what you often say, every time we have this kind of incidents, one fire too many. Now, what do we call this one? I, I don't know what you make of it, guys. Well, you heard what the governor said yesterday, um, Ayo. He said, although they're still waiting for the final investigative reports to be out, this fire was totally avoidable. He says from what they're saying, preliminary reports indicate 
that this fire was caused by negligence and carelessness. And that's something that we can work on. That's something that we should work on. You know, when we see situations that are dangerous, potentially to the public, we shouldn't overlook it. Uh, it might not be us cutting it. You never can tell who will be cutting it. I think we should just do our part because this, I mean, looking at the devastation, looking at the destruction, the fact that how many days after it's still smoldering, 14 buildings involved. We don't know how many countless small businesses um, are, are taking the hit for this, even though the governor says, well, there will be some reprieve for these traders. Uh, but if an incident is totally avoidable, then by all means, let's prevent it. Chamberlain. You know, there are just so many things going through my head, and I just thought, look, it's, um, I don't want to be on a gloomy morning, but unfortunately, many of those people have to grapple with all of that. What happens to insurance in this country? Whatever happens to the authorities who are supposed to ensure that standards are upheld at every point in time, wherever they are, the officials of government who should be there? What about the people themselves, who themselves should have also taken at least some basic standard operating procedure. So it's a whole gamut of things, guys. A lot has gone wrong in society. And look, if we don't, you know what that proverb, when you throw a stone in the market, you don't know who's it's going to, well, gonna it's hit. Going to be your relative. You, you do not know. So it's one of those. Unfortunately, I hope, we always say this, we hope we learn our lessons. And practically so too, unfortunately. All right, well, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, some of the dailies, Ayo. We begin the papers this morning with the Vanguard newspaper, which leads with the Lagos Calabar Coastal Road. Uproar over costs as FG proposes 3,000 Naira per toll gate. And look at what the riders are saying. Cars to pay 1,500 Naira, trucks 5,000 Naira, as according to uh, the Minister of Works, Engineer Dave Umaki says, landmark resort jobs won't be affected. Property owners to be compensated. It's a highway to fraud and waste, as described to former Vice President Atuku. FG not tired of inflicting pains on Nigerians. That's according to LP, that's the Labour Party. Any toll above 300 Naira unacceptable, described to CUPP. Luxury bus operators kick, say passengers will bear the brunt. Road may become highway of exploitation in fraud, according to NLC. Cost must be recovered. Unwilling motorists should ply alternative routes. That's ascribed to the APC's cry. Find the details of that story on the inside page. It's page five, to be precise. The Daily Trust newspaper is still in the same line, but its perspective is different. No personal interest in 15 trillion Naira coastal highway project. That's ascribed to Umahi. Procurement didn't follow due process, as the article insists. Kwai Tinubu is linked to Chiguri family. What does that mean? Someone said it. The details of who said what is on the inside pages. Look at that story below the uh, pictures of uh, Mary Makers. This course post 37 apologies to Band A customers in one week. Did you get any apology? Let's know what you think. The information will be on your screen shortly. The leadership newspaper has this on its own front page this morning, and it's talking about FG embarking on overhaul of justice sector. That story is on page four, declares electoral laws, others a cake, plans national justice reform summit with NJC, NBA. Details on the inside pages. Blueprint newspaper uh, is talking about the justice summit of April 24, Prospect of terminating more cases at appeal court, others top agenda. FG moves to adopt revised national policy on justice. In the second rider, policy will promote social cohesion, good governance, as ascribed to the Attorney General Fabian. You find the details continue on the inside pages of the paper. 
Blueprint also has the story. Implement 2014 Confab report now. NTEF tells FG urges National Assembly to drop perennial constitution review. Details of that continue on the inside pages. Daily Times newspaper leads with that particular story. Adopt 2014 Confab report. NTEF tells Tinubu says this will prove Tinubu's much touted desire to restructure Nigeria. What does all of that mean? The details you find on page four. Flip to this Nigeria newspaper, and it is talking about Chibok. Ten years after, pupils still at risk. Human Rights Watch raises the alarm. Over 1,600 students abducted since 2014 across northern Nigeria, says group, tasks FG on implementation of Safe Schools Initiative. The details of that you'll find on page four. The picture at the bottom of the page is of Governor Babajide Sonwolu addressing the press during his assessment visit to the Dosumo market fire incident in sight in Lagos. And the details continue on the inside pages. New Telegraph has this on its front page. Humanitarian Ministry probe. FG lifts restriction on NPAR staff's accounts. Post no debit order placed on over 55 situation room workers' accounts since December. All of that you'll find on the inside pages. That picture of uh, Governor Sonwolu at the site of the Supersumo fire is also right there on the front page. The Guardian newspaper has this on its front page, a concern, hard times for addicts. It's a big story on pages four and five. Fresh concerns as youths get high on feces, nutmeg, illicit substances. Gosh, and look at the images on the front page and the infographics. In 2023, 15 drug kingpins bagged 168 years of imprisonment collectively. The seizure of assorted illicit drugs rose to 1.6 million kg uh, plus uh, 13,000 plus arrests and uh, more than 5,000 offenders charged to court and more than 3,000 convictions. The details of that story you find on the inside pages of the paper uh, this very morning. Ask the Guardian newspaper this morning. Look at the Daily Independent. It's interested in the prize war in the aviation industry. How FG can help airpiece battle prize war conspiracy as ascribed to experts. Say foreign carriers threatened by airpiece expansion. Um, is that something you are interested in? I believe you should be if you're a Nigerian, a patriotic one at that. The details continue on the inside pages. Nigerian News Direct has this one on its front page about price crash of diesel. Dangote refinery diesel will reduce Nigeria's inflation. That's a statement attributed to Aliko Dangote, the details you find on page 13 of the paper this morning. Business Day newspaper. If you've been having downtime on your transactions, this will interest you. Banks ramp up IT spending amid e-payment boom. What does that mean? The details on the inside pages. Lagos, London, airfares drop further as competition hots up. Well, someone is wondering, is London the only destination? Well, maybe London is, Lagos, London is now, for now, the hot cake. But that's what you have on the front page of the Business Day newspaper this morning. The Nigerian Observer has this one. Edo deepens telemedicine to drive quality healthcare delivery. Launches program in S and West Council. Details of that story continue on the inside pages. Definitely something somebody will be interested in. And right above the nameplate, FG still paying electricity subsidy despite ban A tariff hike. As ascribed to the minister to pay 1.8 trillion naira for 2024. What does that mean? Someone is asking. Don't bother. Just go to the front page of the paper, and the details continue on the inside pages. And with the Nigerian Observer this morning, we take a wrap on the look at the papers. But what is your own take?
and what we take away. There's so much to take away. But for me, what's sticking out this morning is first the apology which the Minister of Power had to you know, put forward to Nigerians, apologizing over the fact that he said that Nigerians put on their freezers and their ACs and leave the house because of low tariffs. And, and that's certainly not the situation. If you ask many women, I mean, even men too, and in why, the, why it is they leave their freezers on, they certainly will tell you an earful. So it's good to see that the minister realizes that what he said was totally out of touch uh, with reality. But if you look at the front page of Daily Trust, you also see the story here. Disco's post 37 apologies to Band A customers in one week. Let's put it down to teething problems. Okay, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say it's early days yet. What? Uh, but the very Jane. fact that they are apologizing. Uh, trembling. <laughs> I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> it's not early. I'm going to ignore that. These are the things that saying, discos have been grappling with for give them years. Long, give them a long rope, okay? This nah. is the first time they're saying the rope is we must snapped. give Band A customers 20 hours compulsorily. Because now they're paying 225 naira. They're the golden goose is laying the golden egg right now. So let's give them a very long rope and see how many they post within the next one month. We hope the apologies reduce. And we also hope that attention will be paid to other banks. Because ideally, if all of this was already happening, the reason why NERC approved this tariff increase was because there was, that structure was already in place and it was supposed to be that, you know, Band A customers that were categorized as Band A were already getting this service. So you have to ask what then is causing them to apologize to them 37 times in one week. Um, but as I said, early days yet, teeth and problems, let's put it down to that. But the very fact that they're communicating is suddenly, uh, will I say, a positive sign. So let us hope that those lines of communication remain open, not only to Band A customers, but to all the other customers on the other bands. Well, look, um, first, I think it comes across as though the Minister of Power is distracted with his quest to become governor of all your states. Oh, Number dear. One. Because... Oh, that's clear now. Well, I said it comes across. You know, so people can internalize it the way they want. So it's up to him to correct it. No, I'm saying his ambition for that is clear He's now. He's always had ambition. And if you just take care of always wanted to be governor. Um, besides, so it just comes across as though these things are not thought through. And all those comments you know, attributed to him, it just shows you how disconnected some of these political office holders are with the people. And you know, about the discourse, I don't know who they're communicating with because... I haven't received anything whatsoever. As a customer, as a customer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I haven't seen nothing. Who are they apologizing to? What, what did they post the apologies? So I, I don't know where. Maybe it's... Maybe on it's the, on their Twitter page. Maybe know. it's on their... Maybe so it's on if papers. You if you don't follow them on that, maybe you may not see it. And besides, look, there's just so much to unpack with some of this. But the challenge is, this is not the only time or the last time that you hear about this tariff increase. If the so-called band A, who are supposed to be the goose laying the golden egg for all the other bands, are complaining at this time. What happens when they talk about mighty 2025 or 2026, which they're supposed to talk about again, appropriate pricing, where they increase tariff again? Are we supposed to also accept that and say you give... Uh, it's just a lot that they have to deal with because the ripple effects, I don't know how, if, if at all, they, it's properly thought out because it doesn't look as though it is. It looks as if they're just being prodded by IMF or anybody who need that money, just get some, find somewhere to get some of these funds back. But it's up to the people to keep giving us their feedback because we love to hear and they need to hear it as well. After all, the policy affects you. We'll be back in a moment here. Don't go away. The leadership newspaper has this on its own front With Globo, you order anything you want, and when you receive it, you celebrate it with your whole body. Because when that tasty grilled chicken is here, the weekend starts.
the ingredients for your favorite recipe just in time. And when the cake arrives, the party is on. Because receiving anything on Global deserves a damn. Download the app, order anything you want, and track it minute by minute until it arrives. Global, order anything we deliver in minutes. The Duchess International Hospital caters to every aspect of a family's health needs. A one-stop shop for maternity and child health services, emergency medicine and critical care, medical and surgical subspecialties, dental and eye care, and a range of other subspecialties and services, all available at a single location right here in the heart of Ikeja. And it really doesn't matter if you're paying out of pocket using your HMO or private insurance. We focus completely on providing that world-class affordable health care for all the family at all times. executives face local macroeconomic turbulence and global geopolitical upheavals. Don't worry, Texam UK got your back. A transformative journey with Texam Strategies for Sustainable Organizational Success Program, April 24 to 25, 2024, in Lagos, will position you and your organization for these challenges. Our interactive sessions, games, assessments, and peer-to-peer -peer learning are unique with a great faculty led by John Peters, former chair, Association of MBAs, and ex-prisoner of war, delivering action insights for you to navigate uncertainties and thrive. Pay 3 million 155,250 Naira by March 15th for your spot and enrich your leadership skills in resilience, innovation and sustainable growth. Apply now via plus 44 7425 883 or exec at texm.co.uk. It's a strategic opportunity to win. Texam, insights that inspire, actions that change the world. With Global, you order anything you want, and when you receive it, you celebrate it with your whole body. Because when that tasty grilled chicken is here, the weekend starts. The ingredients for your favorite recipe, just in time. And when the cake arrives, the party is on. Because receiving anything on Global deserves a damn. Download the app, order anything you want, and track it minute by minute until it arrives. Global, order anything we deliver in minutes. My name is Tinola Akimbolagwe. I'm the MD CEO at the Private Sector Health Alliance of Nigeria, Pisha. So Pishan is very excited to be a partner with Medic West Africa as a conference partner. And we're looking forward to using that platform to bring together subject matter experts, uh, looking at how we can focus on healthcare investments, investing in the health sector in Nigeria. We have various stakeholders, uh, subject matter experts who will bring their own insight, uh, look at the challenges that we have and look at how we can mitigate some of these issues. So I eagerly look forward to seeing you all at the Medic West Africa event, which will be on the 17th to the 19th of April, 2024, at the Lagos Landmark Center. It promises to be a very impactful one. to your oath of office to defend the interest of all rivers people in accordance with the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. You have done that standing on firm ground 
and with the strength and courage of a lion. We are, we are, we are proud of you. Politics is over. It is now time for governance. And you have hit the ground running. You have touched the critical sectors in less than one year in office. Our people say I should tell you to stand firm with the president, align with his positive policies, and carry reverse people to the engine room of government in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. For those who have not bothered to pay attention, if you look at the map of Nigeria, the entire map of Nigeria is sitting on River State. When River State comes, Nigeria will catch cold. So regard, regard your office as key and vital. Don't look back. It is not a matter of age. It is a matter of your people are with you. And they've asked me to tell you that you are the political leader of River State. of This is a gathering of politicians traditional rulers, women groups, as well as other stakeholders of Ikwere Descent at the Emoha Local Government Area Council of River State. They are here for a meeting and their aim is to restate their support for the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Nyesum Wiki. We are behind you. Leading the group is the local government chairman, Chidi Lloyd, who in his speech refers to Mr. Wiki as the undisputed leader of the PDP in the state. We are here to renew our commitment to the renewed hope agenda and to thank the president for finding one of our own, our leader, the leader of the People's Democratic Party in River State, Chief Honorable Barista, and the one in his own meeting. <laughs> for finding him worthy to be appointed as the first Southerner the first Southerner to sit as Minister for the Federal Capital Territory. Interestingly, the former Chief of Staff, who is also a Commissioner in the current administration, as well as a member of the State House of Assembly, re echo Mr. Lloyd's statement about the status of the Minister of the FCT in River State PDP. It is ridiculous and funny to see that instead of people focusing on governance, Focusing on delivering and discharging the responsibility with which they sought for vote and they were voted for. All you hear every day is that Wiki did not do this and Wiki did not do that. Is Wiki see the governor of River State? I stand with Chief Barista Ezekwe here to Wiki. I stand with Ahmed Gola Tinubu. So, my people, I want to thank you for your show. Of At the end of the exercise, a communique stating the position of the assembly is read out. That we urge Mr. President to beware of certain politicians who are currently parading themselves in River State as supporters of the Tinibu administration. We are aware that these politicians were supporters of a presidential candidate with whom they maligned and disparaged the personality of Mr. President during the 2023 campaign and election. These politicians have gathered under a fair political platform to destabilize and make the system. This is yet another in a series of ongoing political battles between supporters of the former governor and his successor, Simon Alai Fubara, in their political face-off. Charles, Upper Room, Channels Television News. All right, yes, indeed, uh, that is what we're going to focus on this morning. And we've got uh, Mr. Openabo Inkotaria, he's a public affairs analyst and former aide to 
the former governor of River State, Mr. Enrique himself. He joins us virtually. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on the program today. Good morning, Chamberlain. Quite a while. Yes, indeed. And incidentally, we play both. I think I, yes. As as small quite there, is she still there? <laughs> indeed, I'm here. Yes, good morning, Ted. Good to see you. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Yes, indeed. And uh, Ayo is on the other side, so you get to hear from all of us. And incidentally, we played both reports. Uh, we're also expecting Mr. Chidi Lloyd to also join us. Uh, but in the meantime, all of this going on. You know, one key thing several people keep asking, which we keep asking ourselves uh, anytime we see anyone from that area, any opportunity we have. What really is the bone of contention in the first place? Yes, my brother Chamberlain, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite obvious to everybody that is interested in politics and most especially those are interested in reverse politics. Wiki has, on several occasions, he vaunted that he was instrumental to the emergence of St. Fubara against all odds. And so ordinary, we should expect this harmonious relationship between the governor and the federal capital minister, Yeso Wiki, being his political godson. But I must tell you, Chamberlain, that in the last eight years in River State, it was a painful laughter on the metallic hell of the roads. Painful. You could see people smile. Thank God. Today we heard of the former deputy governor, um, Telekuru, who said he spent his resources, time, everything. And at the end of the day, he was not appreciated. We heard of Lee Meba. We heard of all kinds of testimonies from all kinds of persons. And it was because we had more or less a dictator in office. We had a situation where if you reason a tangent to him, there was always a penalty. You had trumped up charges and so on. Even during the uh, last elections, we had Farada Gogo and all those stuff. But why do we have the present in Brooklyn that we have in River State? It's simple. We had a situation where you were instrumental to the emergence of somebody as a governor, the man as a mess, and expected to discharge, perform his role as a governor. You forget the fact that you have existed, exited, sorry. You are the one who said to Ambody, who served unfortunately just one time, that Godfatherism will be resisted in River State. You said so. You also channeled, your, 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 you have this pension for covering, uh, being part of his media chat. So you have all that. You've also said that you will never interfere once you leave office as a governor. Because you hated when people interfere in your governance. You said Megu made all these promises. But unfortunately, after you left, you were asphyxiating the governor. You wanted the governor to do exactly what you want him to do and not what the people want him to do. So it's a question of, to answer a question, answer a question directly, it's a problem of Godfatherism. The pestilence of Godfatherism incited ignited the imbroglu we have in River State today. It was okay. not all about so, yeah. governance. It was not all about, okay, for, uh, sorry. You heard yeah. when he even said, we are, we are there, we are there, Chamberlain. When he even said, nobody will tamper with his structure, he will not allow that. Are we talking of structure right now? We are not talking of structure as we speak right now. We are talking of governance. Like the former governor, Peter, who had the greatest structure in River State who is the godfather of modern day, the father of modern day River State from 1999. He had the best structure. He handed over okay. to uh, Obeya. So, Eventually, so, the court brought in Amit. Welcome in the place. So that I just hope that the clarity of what I'm saying mm. will be clearly understood and logic captured the judgment of people. It took penetrate their mind. Now, all the left, Amit came in. Amit left. Uh, Omeya came in, then the court said, no, not Omeya, Amechi. Amechi left. Wiki came in. Nobody interfered. 
And it is also the constitution in, of the PDP that the governor is the leader of the party in the state and the president, the leader of the party in the country. So I cannot comprehend why that statement of the revived Dr. Peter Odili would generate the kind of furor it is generating right now. I cannot comprehend it. Why you do cry? This paroxysm of uh, 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 irritation whenever the issue of uh, the governor of River State is being, is being mentioned. I, I can't comprehend it. We all know when he was a governor of the state, who was the leader of the party in the state? That is a conundrum. That is a question you should ask yourself. Okay, so. It's not a question of debate. It's not so, a question so the, of debate. The thing is this I mean, um, for instance, and uh, by the way, when you say pension, look, m media houses go for uh, charts that they are invited for, so they don't just barge in like that. So it's a point No, I didn't. I went, no, 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 no. Don't, 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 please, don't, go mis there. Don't, mis don't misunderstand me. What okay. I mean by pension, what I mean by pension is like, it, it, you know, whenever it has to do with media chat, whenever it has to do with Jason Wiki, not just channels, so to speak, it's not just mm -hmm. channels. You know, people want to listen because it's like news. Oh, okay. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. So, it is, so not, it is not said in a derogatory manner. I get yeah. you. So the thing is this, I mean, even uh, no matter which government you look at, uh, as recent as history of former President Jonathan, you know, people would demonize and say it was the worst. Another one comes in and then he will always have his supporters. The next one comes in, oh, it's so terrible, they will always have their supporters. People will even write books about all of those things. So in Rivers, we've seen a similar narrative. Even when uh, Mr. Amici was there, you had people who were on the other side. Uh, when Governor Wiki was there, in fact, now in the report you played, you have people who are on this side, people who are on this other side. So politics, game of interest. I mean, up until recently, yeah. the narrative we heard was that some of those people now who are on the other side, some of them wanted to be governor. Some of them didn't want this same man who is there now as governor. They said, no, never. How can he? Uh, so those kind of things are things that baffle so many Nigerians when they see. But people didn't support him. And then he becomes governor. Then you ditch and go here. So they think, oh, so is this just a chess game? Politicians, you're the enemy of my friend is my. So isn't that the kind of scenario that is playing out now? Just basically game of interests? Well, I completely agree with you, if you can hear me clearly. Yeah, I can hear you. Can I speak? Okay, politics, yes, like you rightly said, is a concerted circle of conspiracies and articulated interests. No doubt about it. You see, but that is when you're politicking. Now, we've passed that stage. We are talking of governance right now. I must be very honest with you. A lot of people we are vast to the emergence of Sim Fubara, despite the clamor for a riverine government because of where he was coming from. A lot of persons believe that with Sim Fubara in office, the FCC minister was going to be the governor by proxy. And so that apprehension was palpable and pervasive. And that's why, yes, I agree. One or two persons would have also indicated interest to say we want to run. There's nothing wrong with that. They, all those. That he's been that that he's been uh, that he has been vilified today have the right and are all competent to contest. But in this game, one person, only one man will be chosen. He was chosen. Now, when he emerged as the governor of the state, for one, two, three months, we all saw what happened. For those of us that are in River State. And the man decided, he said to himself, oh no. I'm being asphyxiated. And don't forget that when a man is pushed to the wall, he bounces back with a double therefore. No, did, did he make this public in an I, announcement? I, 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 I will come into that, Chamberlain. Just a minute. He bounces. And you know, like the question they asked, for how long will feverish best tremble in silence before its owners? How long will this pestilence of godfatherism continue? I have a legacy to keep. If for to be quick, if for example, at the end of the four years, I am not being applauded for what I have done as a governor. The, the, the damage, the criticism will not go to my, my predecessor or my Bennett, the man who, who was instrumental 
to my emergence. I will be criticized for life. When I will concede certain things to you, don't also be oblivious of the fact that I have a name and I'm also the governor of a state. I'm governing persons. This is a man who was a DFA. This is a man who was a Canton general. He worked with the former minister. So he is aware and cognizant of the sufferings of the people uh, and okay. the shortcomings of the last administration. So he wanted to make those amends. And in making those amends, the FCTs have felt he had crossed the bar. That's just the genesis of the open. Okay, so if I could just jump I'm in sorry, again and ask you. But as yeah. we speak right now, a lot of persons are very happy. That's why you find out that the enconiums, the plaudits, uh -huh. over outweigh, outweigh the criticism. So let, let me ask People you this then. Say, oh, thank God. You know, yes. before uh, we got to this stage, at the initial yes. stage when this all started when people were a little surprised, saying, ah, what's going on? They thought, even if this was mm. going to happen, mm. they thought it was pretty mm. early and they didn't understand what was happening. People were asking, so what's the issue? And then after a while, all of a sudden, they heard that there was a meeting in Abuja. There was an agreement. Mm. Even some mm. persons who were uh, supporting the governor thought, no way, you cannot do that again. No. So, <laughs> well, I didn't even get, we didn't get a chance to ask you yourself. So they kept on going that way. So that's why I did ask you, this game of interest, are, are people not going to be surprised yet again when, because people, which I know you know, they have a way of settling some of these things all of a sudden, and then every other person is it's left politics. in the lurch. It's politics, So yeah. that's the, the question. Where do the people come in here? Because only recently, the State of Assembly was saying, look, the agreement that was signed, the governor is not fulfilling his own part of that agreement. And as such, mm -hmm. we will be left with no choice than to proceed. So whatever else anybody says in the court of public opinion, there was an agreement, which the governor was privy to. Now, my brother, Chamberlain, are you done? Should I talk? Go ahead. Uh, are you done? Chamberlain. Now, I don't really want to go into the issue of the House of, the House of Assembly because... It might be subject, it's a matter in court. Because the, the legality and legitimacy of those members been questioned in court. You said you have defected, you're not members of the APC. And you have plethora of cases to bolster the assertion, the fact that once you defect, when there is no schism in a political party, or when there is no merger, you have lost your seat automatically. Well, since and that one no is in court, in you could leave it. What about yeah, the agreement? That, that is it in court? No, one minute, I'm coming, I'm coming to that. I said, why I don't want to really go into that? So as far as I'm concerned, what we have is legislative parambulation. That's what I just, that's, that's what I described, legislative parambulation. So I don't want, because uh, they, do they have the teeth to bite? That's the question. Are they still members of the House of Assembly? <laughs> that's the first question there. So if you say the House of Assembly. Now, the governor himself, at grave personal inconvenience, decided to implement the eight-point agenda, which most reverse people are against. Because let us be factual. Mr. President is subject to the law. It's not the law. That agreement is not legally binding. Let me take you back to the Aburi conference. When they reached an agreement and at the end of the day, they found out that the agreement reached was going to be inimical to the unity of Nigeria. What did God want to do? So if I reach an agreement with you, out of desperation or anything, or respect, and I come back home and realize that that agreement will be inimical to my people, what do you want me to do? But does the, gov does the governor share this view? Trying... No, I'm coming. I said... I've not talked with him. That's why I said, even at Great because he kept saying he was going to implement, and he has implemented a lot of them. <clears throat> you know, some, people, some left, people will say uh, that. Uh, 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 Mark, just one minute. What priority is left, and what most of them are angling for, is just the representation of the budget. The matter is in court. Uh, all right, then. Yes, Otherwise, most of those people would have been out of, out, out, they would have par uh, par uh, paraded themselves as legislators. Okay. And so, but it's just, it's just because of the budget. And that the matter is in court. All right, so I'd, I'd like do? to take you up on a few things that, you know, on a, well, on the significance of a few things. First, 
the statement of former governor Peter Odili, Dr. Peter Odili, who said, politics is over, it's time for governance. Do you think that really, with that statement, and the fact that he's endorsing uh, the current governor of the state as a leader of the, of the state and the, of the political party, do you really think that politics is over? Or has it just started? No, what he's trying to say, and what any, any right-thinking member is um, extrapolate to what uh, our referral topic said, is, look, let us leave the past behind. Whatever has happened, let us concentrate now on governance. That's just the point. And he also went a step further to say, the leader of the party is being, he did, he is the government. He did not say anything extraordinary. It is so in their constitution. I'm not a member of APC. I'm not a member of PDP. I don't belong to a political party as I speak. So what he's trying to say, this is going to, the leader of the party, the governor is the leader of the party in the state, and the president is the leader of the party in the country. Mm -hmm. Now you ask, well, look, I will bread turn to stone in the mouth of another and remain bread in your mouth. When you are governor of River State, you are the leader of the party in the state. He said he bought all forms, which is even criminal. All the forms for all the contest contestants. That is not even criminal. With whose money? Is that not anti-democratic? Okay. He said he bought. Why did the PDP submit those forms? Simply because he was the leader of the party. So uh, why will bread turn to stone in the mouth of another? That is the burning question. That is a question anybody should ask. Well, there were two, there were two events yesterday. One that happened in yeah. Dr. Peter Odili's uh, hometown of Undani, and another one happening with uh, in the Ikwere community led by uh, Dr. Chidi Lloyd and also... Uh, we saw the former chief of staff to the governor there, Mr. Emeka Woke, who is a commissioner in this current arrangement. So when you say, I mean, the very fact that those two meetings held yesterday uh, in two different areas, um, does it tell you anything? Uh, does it say much? And, and the fact that all of them are now saying, look, Mr. Governor, align yourself with the president. Make sure that, you know, you bring the people of Rivers to the federal, to, to, they're involved with whatever is happening at the federal level. And you have another group saying, Mr. President, beware of those who did not support you in your ambition. And there's some people are uh, pretending, et cetera, et cetera. What do you make of these two statements at two separate gatherings tell you. in two separate communities? I will tell you. Yes, I will tell you. First and foremost, you have the two separate gatherings because the original plan was to commission the health facility donated by Dr. Peter Odele, former governor of Rivers. And in order to foot wrong, mm. to, to in order to steam it, in order to, uh, 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 how will I put it, um, take the shine off, trying to take the shine off that occasion, they had another gathering with all the antiques. Now, to tell you that the governor is a man with a very large heart, a man who is insisting or trying to implement the eight-point agenda. How will a commissioner speak ill of a governor and remain as a commissioner? It's not done anywhere in this country. But he left it. Not that he, he has blood flowing in his veins. But because of the eight-point agenda, what Mr. President has said, he left it. Otherwise, why will you impose a commission on the government? It's not done. Even the president himself had a major battle with president, uh, former President uh, Obasanjo as a governor of Lagos State. We all are aware of that. The LCDs. No man will go. No, no, no governor is going to prove that. Mm. Well, there the are questions as to, I mean, I, 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 listening to what he said, can it be interpreted as speaking ill? The fact that you... Uh, support somebody doesn't mean that you speak ill of another person, does it? No, 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 no. They refer to the SCD as a leader. It is, it is committing political suicide. As a commissioner, you refer to somebody else who is antagonizing your principle as your leader. It's like having a mole in the system. It's committing uh, political suicide. Uh, 
but it is being tolerated by the governor. Not because Mr. Woke is too powerful, not because the FCT minister would have done anything if he had said, I suck you and get out. No. But because he had a pact with Mr. President. That he can control. The other one is a legal matter. He cannot control. It's a matter of the courts. That's why it's almost all the things are agreed on. Thank that Tataria. are not legally binding. Mm -hmm. Don't have legal implications. Well, he sorted them out. And I respect he has for... Yeah, just, just one second. I mean... Um... There's something you said earlier that it is of interest to me, and I, and I think it might help some people to understand exactly what is going on here. First, you said earlier that you know the the leader of a party in the state is the governor, and that the leader of the party in the nation, in the ruling party in the nation or any party at that, is the president. But it wasn't so in the first republic. It wasn't so in the second republic. Not even in the third republic. The national chairman of the political party, just one second if you can hear me, the national chairman yes, of the party yes. is the yes. leader of the party in those first yes. three republics. What changed it this time? And why is it now the subject of, part of the subject of this political upheaval that's happening everywhere, including in River State? Out is a grip for power. Unlike yesterday, you are talking of the first group. The second report, that is the Shagari tenure. Shagari went in for a meeting before the national chairman. Then we're almost practicing party ideology. Do we have any ideology right now? Even national assembly has seen it. Is it over also? Who defected? Is he not still a senator? Do people join political parties? on ideological grounds? No. That's why even the Amethyst case, when the Supreme Court said, you vote for the party and not for the individuals, I disagreed. Because that is trying to import the American system. Yeah, you don't vote for party. You vote for individuals. That if that were the case, if that if were the case, Mr. Inkotaria, just, just a second, party, on that particular subject, to another party, which is on wrong. that particular I mean, subject, if, if yeah. that were the case, then to be the face of the subject on the ballot paper and not that of the political party. But as you said, that's a, that's a matter that can be discussed some other time. That, yes, Perhaps yes. some history might yes. also as help. As we speak right now, yeah, it just, is just one second. There's a head in the state and the president, the leader at the national level. Is there a, law, right is there a law that supports that position? Parties. They are parties. They are parties. And what did the law say? There are decided cases. We are not going to interfere in that party matters. They are parties. But they, I, again, am not I am not comfortable with that situation. I love the 19, 1979 situation. Hmm. But that is what it is right now. It was a simple situation in the now. Third Republic because I, there are a good number of people who will remember that Tom McKimmy was the chairman of the NRC at the time and was a very, very prominent face of the party. But there is also, in yes. this Fourth Republic, uh, this challenge, this political face-off that we've been having in River State started as far back as 1999. And it will seem like every governor has had that issue with their predecessor. And this definitely is no, no, no different because uh, some who have said, look, we saw that this was going to happen. We just didn't know it was going to happen so soon. What really is the problem? And how can we put an end yes. to this? Otherwise, but, it will continue until infinitum. No. Um, the situation, the circumstances are not the same. They are not. Now... Transition from Peter Delay to Omeha. Sadly, the court is saying they don't recognize as a government. To Omeha, then Omeha to. Uh, uh, Hello. Uh, I make it. The difference Hello. is this: it's not about control. Hello. Let's not forget that transition is not about Tell control. Tell me, we are calling my line. That's different. Then from the issue of Amechi to Wike, it's also not control. It has to do with succession. 
Now, the problem right now is the problem of control. So they are different. They are different scenarios. Okay. As you said, every governor has had that challenge with their successor, with, the, with their predecessor. From Governor Odile to Omehia to Amechi to Wike and now Fubara. That's the situation that has happened up until this moment. No matter how different the situations are, the manifestations are the same. What really is the issue? Uh, the, 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 that's why I'm telling you, the, the issue of Peter Odile, Peter Odile never wanted control. So that's why I said the two are different. Richard Amechi never wanted control. So the bone of control was all control. But in this particular case, it has to do with control. This other case, we are talking of succession. That's why I'm saying we had the issue of the Kele, which had to do with Roti Michi and that's how Omeo emerged. Then we had the issue of succession. Amechi wanted the river right man, saying the upland had ruled for so many years, about 16 years, they allowed to be the turn of the river right. That was just it. But this one now has to do with control. We're well, trying to get across uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Chidi Lloyd and see what transpires. But let me ask you why we try to solve the connection out with Dr. Lloyd. Um, um, let me ask, did you or do you have information as to what was the agreement between the former governor and the current governor before the former governor chose him to become governor? Do you have an idea what the agreement was? What did you say? Do you have an idea what was the agreement between former Governor Nyosun Wiki and the current Governor Fubara before former Governor Wiki chose him to become governor? At all. No idea at all. So doesn't no idea that, at all. isn't there a possibility that some of our comments might just even be perhaps not knowing what they've agreed on? And we're just commenting in that tangent. Because if we knew what the agreement no, no, was, no, 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 no. we might have no, had no, a deep, no, get, deeper get, insight. Get, Yes, get something straight. Get something straight. Like I said, the the organic support the governor has. Now they say Thanksgiving, red tech crowd as so well. No. Yeah, I understand the organic, the organic support. I mean, we, we can see yeah, some. The, the, but this, the thing is, you. do we have now, that? Now, I, I want, what I want what did they agree on? I want to elucidate. Yeah. And the organic support is not born out of any agreement they reached. It's born out of the policies of the government. The man has come into office and he is there as rivers will think in the image of rivers persons, satisfying them, doing the work and the things that those things expected of him. And rivers will are satisfied. That is just the support. So it doesn't they matter have. what they agreed on. If they are, what if they agreed that they are going to sell government house? No, that's hypothetical. No, I'm asking, so it doesn't no, matter. No, that's what I'm saying. That so if they agree that they're going to, what's my view? No, because if today Fubara says the governor, Fubara is excellency, sorry, says I want to sell government house. But that's how politicians play. <laughs> Isn't it what politicians yeah, do? Not, not, they do that all the time. Like you said, we are also going to demonstrate. But okay. the policies are in tandem with the yearnings of river species. All right. And that is why you have the kind of support. What the support you get is a referendum of his, the approval of the governor's policies. All right. We, we, we thank you very much indeed. We need to anchor at this thank point. Uh, open up on Kutara, thank you. public investor, and former you. aid to Governor Wiki. Thank you. Well, this business no, I thought, on the I thought, I thought, I thought, we, I thought we were going to continue for another one hour. I thought so too, but unfortunately, uh, so, that, so my, bro my brother could come on board. For my brother to up. come on board. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> see what I can do. But at the moment, uh, right. is on uh, fixed time and business. Is now. Away from politics now, let's do some business. And uh, after the long holiday, welcome back to work. That's to you for us. We've been here uh, keeping you abreast of what's happening. This is Business Morning on Sunrise Daily. And I mean, John Mekwa will get. From the global space, oil prices rose on Friday as heightened tensions in the Middle East raised the risk 
of supply disruptions from the oil producing region, the prices are set for weekly losses amid expectations of fewer US interest rate cuts this year. That's an uh, inflation number that really did change some perspective. But let's uh, look at the numbers right here. And uh, we see that even though oil uh, Brent was down 0.57%, it's still above $90. It's $90.25 for a barrel for Brent. WTI also has tapered a bit, but it's still looking good at $85.63, and that's down 0.72%. And now, this, uh, well, not good news have brought this, because we see that the gains uh, erase some losses from previous session, which was dominated by worries about the stubborn U.S. inflation that dampened hopes for an interest rate cut in June. We don't know if that's still going to hold. Also, suspected Israeli war planes bombed Iran's embassy in Damascus in a strike for which Iran has vowed revenge, racketing up tensions in a region already strained by the Gaza war. Israel has not said it was responsible, but Iran's supreme leader has said that Israel must be punished and it shall be for the attack. So we see a lot of tension right there. The U.S. expects an attack by Iran against Israel, but one that would not be big enough to draw Washington into war. This is according to a U.S. official and uh, some Iranian sources. Uh, they also said that Tehran has signaled a response aimed at avoiding major escalation. Meanwhile, on Israel's part, they are keeping up the war in Gaza, but they're also preparing for scenarios in other areas. According to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, he revealed this. So a lot of tension going on there, and then we see it uh, drilling down to this. We see more uh, price increase for Brent and WTI. And still talking about... Uh, the oil space, Nigeria's crude oil production has recorded its second consecutive drop this year from 1.32 million barrels per day in February to 1.23 in March. Uh, and that's according to OPEC's latest monthly oil market report. The 92,000 barrels per day decline recorded in March brings the total loss for the two months to about 196,000 barrels every day. Uh, and then, you know, this is when Nigeria should be uh, just jumping on, I mean, the unfortunate circumstances, but you have the price this high, Brent is what Nigeria does. So imagine if we're doing this 90 compared to about 77 that we have on our budget or in our budget, uh, the gains that Nigeria would have are recorded at this time now is being eroded. Well, looking at the chart for Africa's top oil producers within OPEC, Libya narrowly overtakes Nigeria now with about 1.24 million barrels per day produced in March. Meanwhile, Nigeria's oil rate count rose by another three in March, climbing to 19 from February, which uh, was uh, 16. Well, not so far away from oil now, but still in Nigeria, the chairman of Boy Group, Mr. Samad uh, Rabiu, has commended the steps being taken by the federal government, even as he advises Nigerians to be patient as reforms take time. The businessman was speaking after he paid a visit to President Tinubu in Lagos, also speaking at a separate meeting with the president is the group CEO of Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited, Ms. Amile Kiyari, said that significant improvement has occurred in the country's petroleum market. We all need to come together and uh, support the government, support their policies. You know, the government means well, you know, clearly, and they are trying to support Nigeria, but we need to be patient. You know, these reforms take time, without a doubt. It's not easy. It's not something that uh, can be done within in one day. So we are working together with the government, especially now that the president has, you know, established, you know, this committee, you know, between the government and the private sector. So we're working together. We are supporting each other. We're advising the government and the government is listening. That is very, very important. The fact that the government is listening, you know, means so much, you know, to the private sector. And I think we'll get, you know, to the desired land. It's also a perfect opportunity to reassure Mr. President that his focus on delivering gas into our markets, both domestic and international market, bringing back prosperity to our country is right on course. And this is a, a task that will be delivered. And very many obvious things will, will unfold in the coming weeks. It is very clear that our, our majority of our exports from this country is petroleum as of today that can earn uh, foreign currency. There's significant improvement in the markets in terms of pricing and also
also were able to establish some level of stability in our project. The combination of this is bringing additional resources available to our country. And of course, more than anything, there are clear monetary and fiscal policies that the president and this government has put in place that is working and that is bringing about all the changes that you are seeing in the currency market. Yes, yeah, so uh, moving on now, uh, one of those reforms or the applaud that the federal government is getting at this time, or at least this administration, is that clearance of backlog, FX backlog, especially the aviation sector. Now let's find out if the impact has trickled down now to everyday uh, Affairs, and we're speaking with the president of the National Association of Nigeria Travel Agencies, uh, Mrs. Susan Apurayi. She joins us from our Buja studio. Uh, good morning, uh, Susan. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be here. Good to have you here. So. Um, a lot of things have been happening in the airfare uh, space, especially the, you know, since airpiece uh, started that London route. Uh, and uh, we had Mr. Yima on, on our political show earlier in the week, and he did reveal some things. But first of all, do tell us, uh, w w has anything changed since the clearance of the fare, of, of the FX backlog by the CBN? Um, have we seen the impact, or are things still as it was? As it was? Thank you very much. I, I, I want to say a very big thank you, first of all, to the Minister of Aviation, uh, Festus Keyamo, I say miigwasa, for standing by air peace through and through and making sure this comes to a reality. Air peace have been on this journey, from what I understand, for like over seven years now. And I say migo, sir, to our minister for finally making a dream come true for Dr. Allen Oyema and the entire EPIS team and the entire travel industry as well and Nigeria. Now, when it comes to the price, I will take you a bit back. I will try to summarize as much as I can. Back history a bit. Um, the issue of pricing for us in FS in Nigeria has been a problem for a very long time. In, term, in terms of the fact that fares in Nigeria are usually higher than our neighboring African countries and all that. So the fight for this fares to drop has been a, a long time coming. I mean, two administrations before me have been on this issue. But gratefully, and this is where I also say kudos to our minister, is listening. He has a listening ear. He has an open heart. I remember the very first stakeholders meeting he had, and we expressed our issues, and he, co he committed to addressing them one after the other. You know, it's, it's not just enough to be attacking government. When they are doing well, we should also praise them. So thank you to the administration of Tinibu and our dear minister too as well. There was a clarion call by the regulator and all the agencies involved, which included, included Nanta, to look into this issue. I'm going to talk about it from, the, from um, two perspectives for us to understand. Before all this trap fund issue started, let's not remember that there's a major role that rates of exchange also play in the fair structure as a whole, because first are priced in dollars, then whatever rate of exchange the Naira is selling is what determines what the amount will be in Naira. I mean, before all this started, we were selling at the rate of 300, 400. I can't even remember again because the rate has jumped so high that I've lost track. At that time, we had first going for 400, 600,000 Naira, depending on the destination. And the trap fund issue came on board. And what happened then was the airlines restricted the lower inventories, although not all of them. Some of them remained, uh, still left their lower inventories. But the airline closed up all the lower fares and only left only the high fares. So that was why we now started seeing fares for 2.5 million and 3.5 million. And at that time, rate of exchange was fluctuating between 350 and 450. And guess what? The rates started going up. 600, 700, 800, 900. At the time it was getting there, the same fare of 3.5 went as high as 6 million. And guess what? The, the rates kept going up, 1,000, 1.1, 1, 1, 1, 1,002, until it got to 1,800 and something. And at that time, the same fare that was selling for 3.5 went up to like 7 million. 
because of the rate of exchange. And remember, these are only the highest fares on the system. The lower ones were not released. Then, thank you to our minister. He, 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 he deliberated the, the, the regulator to, to begin to mandate the airlines to release lower inventory. And I can tell you, the regulator, NCAA, and every other agency is involved, including Nanta, we had an intense section with all the airlines one after the other. And the, make, the two major purpose for that engagement was one, for the airlines to release inventories. After all, the rate of exchange is selling as, as much as the, the same thing with black market, there's no difference. So one was for them to release inventory with immediate effect. Two was for them to look at reducing their fares. Those were the two mandates of that committee in which I was part of. And it was an extensive, intense um, um, sections that we had with the airlines. Remember, not all, not all closed inventory. So the ones that closed inventory, some of them 48 hours they released. Some of them one week, asked for one week. Some of them asked for two weeks. So they now released all the lower fares. And once all the lower fares was released, even at the same rate of 1,800, I mean, instead of 7 million, which was the highest fare, we were now getting like um, 2.53 million because the lower ones has been released. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Then, thank you to whatever the current administration, Tinubu, is doing. They are, they are definitely doing something in the right direction. And the rates begin to come down from 1,008 to 1,700, 1,615, 1,014. Now, we are at 1,2. Now, $1,000, hypothetically, of a ticket, when the rate of exchange was 1,800, let's do the math, that's 1.8 million naira. Now, the rate of exchange is 1,200. That same $1,000 is 1.2 million. So already, the, the naira gaining strength against the dollar has already brought about a massive reduction already because tickets are priced in that. Now... Epis came on board. Kudos. Thank you very much, Dr. Oyema, because this wasn't an easy journey for you. And we appreciate you. We love you. I'm sure he, he knows. Because on the maiden flight, myself and my team, we were there. Nanta was fully represented. As a matter of fact, we gave Epis this slogan, Epis our own. We are 100% behind you. And Epis started. When they started, they started first. Remember, I want to remind you, the two mandate that the government... Uh, through the regulator, gave the airlines was one, release with immediate effect of lower inventories. That automatically brought the, uh, um, the, the economic class that was selling for 7 million, 8 million to like 2.5 and 3 million just by releasing the lower inventories. And then rate of exchange, kudos to the policies that has been put in place by, by, by President Tinibu, the rate of exchange started coming down. So the 2.5 fare, that was there at uh, when the rate was 1,800. That same 2.5 fare is now selling for 1.2, 1.1. So that is what we are seeing. That's the immediate reduction that we are seeing. Let us, re I want to also mention here that the regulator also demanded that the airlines to reduce their fare. And if there is reduction in fare that we are experiencing now, one, Yes, definitely. The coming of EPIs has a major part to play in that. We all know, my darling, that competition does what? Drives prices down. So with the coming of EPIs now, Ginger D Airlines, probably, for them to now begin to take the mandate of the regulator more seriously, which is for them to look into the fares that they give to us in Nigeria. Because we all know, and it did not start now, and you see, it's a double-edged sword, if I may use the word. The fact that they, were, they are obeying the, the, the instruction of the regulator because the regulator mandated them to do that or, 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 or risk the fear of being sanctioned. Now, rate of exchange has helped us. And of course, maybe the, the instruction from the regulator is also um, what has contributed. And definitely, the coming of our own airpiece also must have also uh, uh, pushed the airlines to actually begin to um, reduce the affairs. Just wanted to give that history a bit. Uh, you. Well, you are so excited, Susan. I, I don't blame you. I'm sure a lot of Nigerians are also feeling it and, you know, very excited too. Uh, but how do we keep it? We, we, now we've dealt with the trap funds so the foreign airlines can no longer threaten us 
And uh, we see the Naira gaining, obviously, which, as you have noted, is also showing. How do we keep things on the good side? Uh, I mean, I don't think we're happy with Naira at 1, 2. I am rooting for 700. I know that the cutoff is looking at the number, says it's about 980. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for 700. But how do we keep things going in the right direction? How do we avoid especially this issue of trapped funds again so we, we don't have the foreign airlines on, on our throats? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The way that can be resolved is putting the right policies in place, which um, President Tinubu has already started doing. If he continues with these policies that they are putting in place and the, it doesn't get distorted and uh, more policies are being put in place. You know, the issue we have in Nigeria because we're a consuming nation, there's a lot of expenditure in, in, in dollars. And mind you, we do not print, it's not our currency. We don't trade in dollars. So the demand for it was high. If the current administration continues in this right step that they are already putting in place and make sure that Nigeria as a whole, our economy is not dependent on dollar. We they find a way in which we can the, the demand for dollar is reduced drastically in our economy. Then we are already heading to a point in which we will never have issues with these trap funds. And then again, they should also encourage more of Nigerian carriers as well because they are not going to have issues with trap funds like our very own EPIs. As many Nigerian carriers that has the muscle, that has the av availability, please, from what our minister told us and made clear to us, that they are willing to support more to come on board. That is our own way of making sure we depend less on this foreign currency that is not our own. Policies is what will make sure we do not find ourselves in this situation of trap funds ever again. If you remember, this is the third time we're having issues with trap funds. It's just that the other two times have not been this bad. This was the worst of it all, that it went as close to almost $2,000, $1,900 something dollars that was selling at the airline. So let them just continue in this policy, bring in new policies, let the economy of Nigeria be more of homegrown, yeah? Um, uh, patronize our own. I was talking to somebody and um, we were just talking. How do we make sure EPI stands strong in the industry? Uh, we, we are supporting them. For instance, they can come up with a policy that every government official should travel EPIs, except the destination that EPIs does not go to. If it's a destination that EPIs go to, they can come up with a policy that all travels by government officials should be EPIs. That is our own way of patronizing our own. I was talking to, even the same thing goes to the medical sector. I mean, the medical sector also is in shambles. So if those policies can come on board, look, let us patronize our own, made in Nigerian product, no more, just to reduce the, the demand. And thankfully, I also heard that the dollar is still going to, I mean, the Naira is still going to gain more strength because the Dangote refinery and um, uh, the, the, the policy to have modular refineries in different regions as well will make the oil uh, uh, importers and exporters to begin to buy this product in Naira and not in dollar. And I know that sector is the highest demand for US, USD. Their own demand for USD is much more than the aviation sector. But if that highest sector, which is the oil, uh, petroleum sector, can begin to buy this product homegrown and in Naira and export and, and, and sell in dollars. You see, we are now strengthening our Naira against the dollar. And we continue at that pace. My darling, I don't see us falling back to these trap fund issues again. Thank you. All right. Well, I, I tell you, Susan, I can feel your energy, and I totally <laughs> i am in line with you. Thank you so much for your time and for your passion for not just your sector, but I mean the Naira and Nigeria as a whole. President of National Association of Nigeria Travel Agencies, that's Nanta, Mrs. Susan Akuraye. Thank you very much for having me. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. All right, let's take a break now. We'll be back with another conversation. Just stay with us. My name is Tinola Akimbolagui. 
I'm the MD CEO at the Private Sector Health Alliance of Nigeria, Pishan. So Pishan is very excited to be a partner with Medic West Africa as a conference partner. And we're looking forward to using that platform to bring together subject matter experts, uh, looking at how we can focus on healthcare investments, investing in the health sector in Nigeria. We have various stakeholders, uh, subject matter experts who will bring their own insight, uh, look at the challenges that we have and look at how we can mitigate some of these issues. So I eagerly look forward to seeing you all at the Medic West Africa event, which will be on the 17th to the 19th of April, 2024, at the Lagos Landmark Center. It promises to be a very impactful one. Welcome back to watching this this morning on Sunrise Daily. Now let's talk about the ports. Uh, I mean, Susan was just talking about how if we increase our production and our export, we can boost the value of the Naira even more. But when you talk to exporters, they tell you one of the challenges they face is at the port. How do they get their goods out? Um, you know, in good condition and in good time. We're speaking to the managing director of dry ports in uh, Dala Dry Port in Kano, Mr. Ahmad. Rabiu joins us virtually from Kano. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Rabiu, for your time. Good morning. Mr. Rabiu, can you hear me? Um, I wonder what's happening with Mr. Rabiu. I cannot hear him. I wonder if he can hear me. But it's about a year since the Dalla Dry Port started operations in Kano. And the prom promise of that was to reduce the cost of moving export containers, especially within the country, from the northwest to other parts uh, of not just Nigeria, but the world. And they also promised to bring technology into it, into the operations, and reduce the price by as much as 25%. Ease of doing business and creating a one-stop shop for, for ports of, of port activities is also one of those, especially connecting uh, the ports in the northern part to Lagos, where we know most of the activities are. And they also depend much, a whole lot on the rail line. The rail line we've seen uh, from the past administering to the current one are giving attention to rail projects, you know, to see how uh, they can connect the country. Now, of course, we have the, the road, the one from Calabar to Lagos, uh, causing a, raising a whole lot of dust. But I mean, in this case now, um, I think yesterday or two days ago, we did speak to one of our guests about the issues around the port, the infrastructure around the port, and then the number of agencies, even though we've been told that uh, that is being reduced, that the number of agencies and the demands and, you know, the paperwork perhaps is being merged into a point, you know, working towards that issue of a one-stop shop for those port authorities, you know, but... Um, it would have been nice to have this um, managing director of Dala Port tell us what's going on, if they have been able to, um, you know, get some of that. While we wait for him, hopefully we'll get him before the program uh, comes to an end. Uh, let's shift a bit to the market. The markets have been closed since Tuesday, and we saw at the NGX that it's been green, it closed in, in the red, I beg your pardon, and we see that bearish sentiment still going on there. But in the fixed income market, the debt management office has said that it plans to raise 450 billion naira in its upcoming bond auction uh, on April the 15th. That's on Monday, so you want to get set for that. The target is part of the DMO's broader strategy to generate up to 1.8 trillion naira through federal government bonds in the second quarter of this year. We've already started that second quarter. The auction will offer 150 billion naira for each of the following bonds. Uh, the newly issued federal government April 2029 five-year bond. Remember, that's new. That's just been introduced in the second quarter. And then the reopened 2031 seven-year bond and then the 2034 10-year bond. In the first quarter of this year, the DMO raised 2.39 trillion naira through uh, federal government bonds with the largest issuance recorded 
in February. So yes, if you are an investor, this may be an opportunity you have been waiting for, you know, to get um, paid by the government, borrow the government some money. So you invest in bonds, you're borrowing the government money. And we see the yields doing well, hitting 20% and more. Uh, even though, you know, when you compare to the uh, uh, inflation rate, some investors uh, say, well, it would be nice if it's up to the, but that's a lot uh, of uh, debt servicing for the federal government. So let's show a little bit of mercy. But this is another opportunity if you want to invest in the federal government and you want the federal government to owe you <laughs> if it's a year or five years or seven years, uh, that would be, uh, this an opportunity for you. Uh, it opens on Monday. Uh, the 15th of April. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like we can get uh, the managing director of uh, Dry Port, uh, Dalla Dry Port. Perhaps we'll try to get him for the one o'clock program. That's Business Incorporated. So do tune in. We'll try to uh, fix him. I hope by then this network issue will be resolved. He's in Kano, so I guess give him a little bit of excuse. But, well, that's it for uh, on the side of Sunrise Daily. It's business morning on Sunrise Daily. We'll go back now to the Sunrise Daily studio to continue with the program. Yes, indeed, uh, we're going to have him join us now. But before we start the conversation now, well, let's put it out here now. Well, Dr. Chidi Lloyd uh, will be joining us on Monday morning here to uh, give his own perspective concerning what is going on in River State. So he'll be joining us here on Sunrise Daily Monday morning. Let's get to this now. Dr. Alan Manasseh is a strategic team member of the Remelda hashtag Bring Back Our Girls movement. He is also director of media and communication of the Kibaki Area Development Association, CADA, as it's a pan organization of the Chibok community. He's also executive director of Impact Trust International. Good morning and thank you for joining us today on the Good program. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good thank you for having me. How time flies. I mean, who would have thought it's 10 years uh, Sunday ever since that unfortunate incident happened? And, I mean, different people see it differently. I don't know how, you know, you being in that movement and being connected, parents, how they internalize or look back and relate with that particular scenario. But till date, we still understand that there are some persons who are still unaccounted for. So for you uh, and the community, how do you deal with this? Um, it's really difficult to explain because um, as a community, you have um, uh, different feelings around um, uh, what really happened uh, 10 years ago. And um, uh, going into uh, this journey of waiting, hoping endlessly for the rescue of uh, the Chibok girls, um, two years into the abduction, there were girls that were rescued. So if you are describing the feeling of uh, either the parents or as community, it will definitely differ because while some are happy, their children are back, some have been waiting endlessly without ever seeing their children, some have already died while waiting. And um, uh, as it is now, uh, we still have uh, lots of girls missing and uh, uh, no clear uh, kind of uh, communication from the government as a to what exactly is being done to rescue the remaining Chibok girls. No briefing, no uh, update, nothing. So it's just blank. And when we are approaching uh, uh, 10 years, uh, when we are approaching a milestone year mm -hmm. of uh, uh, April 14th, everything comes back to life again. The media engagement, people asking questions, 
the people visiting Chibok trying to ask how are the parents doing, how are the rescued girls doing, how are the, you know, any update on the missing ones. So, and everything comes back to life again without uh, actually having that accountability and closure, especially regarding the ones that are still missing. So it's about trauma, it's about pain, it's about anger, and um, uh, there's nothing one can do about because you have uh, a government over the years that we've been engaging, you know, starting from the government that the abduction happened mm -hmm. under them, and uh, uh, shortly after there was a transition into another government, and President Buhari spent eight years, you know, and now we are in another government, three different governments, and we are on one issue. And when you talk about governments, does this also mean that there was no communication or it went cold? Uh, probably tell us at what point. Did it go cold right from the state governments to federal governments? No communication from any of those whatsoever. All through. All wow. through, there was no communication whatsoever. At some point, uh, before the COVID that the Bring Back Our Guest movement uh, uh, stopped the daily sit-out and the constant you know, engagement between uh, government officials, especially the security agencies and uh, embassies and other heads of government. Um, uh, periodically then, you could get some uh, uh, either announcement or press release coming from the presidency whenever there was uh, either an attack or whenever the Bring Back Our Guests protested to any of the seat, uh, uh, offices of the government then. But as it is now, uh, since the COVID period, we have stopped the constant engagement, physical engagement. So it has gone back to like more of online engagement and some that are into uh, active humanitarian work have gone back to their organizations trying to do things at the background to support the uh, victims of uh, uh, terror at uh, various locations. Because at some point we were complaining only, we were demanding about Dichibok girls mm -hmm. and few others that were abducted. But as it is now, it has gone past that. Mm -hmm. Because the purpose of the Bring Back Our Guests coming out to join um, uh, 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 that campaign was to put pressure on the government to ensure that the guests were rescued immediately. And why people did not even engage in the protest when the Chibok community protested three days into that abduction? Uh, people were still asking questions. Could this be true? If it is true, where are their parents? Where are the girls? Mm -hmm. If it is true, can we see their names? Can we see their pictures? And even the government was then still doubting because uh, you have the DSS bringing different lists of people missing, number. It was only number even. If the police were, were bringing, uh, was bringing different things, the government was talking, you know. And we at the ground, on ground in Chuba, we are telling them that, no, these girls were more, are more than the number you are talking about. While the military was busy saying, we've rescued all remaining nine. We were saying, no, we are still trying to track the number of the girls that have actually been, take, been taken because some are still running back from, uh, you know, being scattered around. And we are waiting for parents to confirm the availability of their children at home. And 15 days after, they bring back our guests, joined the campaign and said, no, we cannot allow this to happen. We can't normalize it. Because if you could remember, Prior to the abduction in Chibo, something happened in Buniyadi, the federal government college, where terrorists came and massacred 49 children, and it was like, it's normal, let's move on. And some people said, no, we can't move on. These are girls that went to school looking for education. And this is a state that's supposed to be, as at then, under state of emergency in a government school, and they were taken. So it's not normal. Do something and rescue them. And the desk start we started counting days now we are 10 years exactly well I, I do not think that anybody who joined that you know that activism at that point you know thought that 10 years on they will still be here demanding uh, the return or the bring back of you know girls who were abducted in the school how would you say that perceptions over the years have changed with regards to the abduction of the Chibok girls exactly as you captured it many were thinking that uh, it's not possible to have this large number of girls taken from school and then it will take this long. So when the protest started, many thought it will take a few days and the government will do the needful. 
either negotiate the release of the girls or use the conventional security forces we have to pursue, overtake, and rescue the girls by force from the terrorists and end the game right there. But uh, that didn't happen. Many got uh, fatigued in the process because it continued. And some that have been so visible on that protest, they feel at this point we can't draw back. And sadly so, Chibok is a very small community and we don't have more politically informed people in the community. Majority of these parents are even unschooled. So they could do nothing on their own. So when many among these advocates discovered that this is the true reality of what how Chibok is, they felt, no, we have to stand with these people. And the protest continued. And some, their health were challenged. Some took a some lot of, of insults. No, some of the uh, oh. members of the Brimbak Yeah, We had so many people that, you know, died in the process of that struggle. Members of the movement? Members of the movement. So many people died in the process of that movement, in, the, in that campaign. Some got, got sick. And if you could remember, you are, the anger is, you are advocating for girls that were taken to come back. You don't even know these girls, but you felt it's only human to do that because if it was you or any of your loved one that was abducted, you would also want people to advocate for your return. But those, those same people that were campaigning for Chubo were maligned. Some of them were called names, terrorist sympathizers, this and that. So it was so painful when you know deep down inside of you you are doing the right thing and some people are feeling uh, this is political. You are being motivated by other people to do. You are being paid to yeah, do. But, well, you know, you are not getting anything. You are just doing it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, but I want to believe that over time, I mean, yes, when the movement started, it was a politically charged time. And at that time, you know, a lot of things were said, a lot of things, were, you know, people endured. Even the media was a bit divided, you know, along whether or not this really happened. Um, moving on, I mean, after 2015, when, you know, there was engagement with President Buhari, uh, the Buhari regime, after a while, it would seem that, it, you know, the Chibok, the Bring Back Our Girls um, advocacy movement and also the Buhari government, you know, they, they lost hope, it would seem, in terms of whether the government was serious enough to bring these girls back. But we've seen, you know, that there's been a trajectory, there's been a movement of some sorts. Some girls have been returned, uh, or let's say a substantial number of the girls have been returned, but many more are still there. Would you say that there is now a sense of loss, a sense of maybe it's time to move on? Because I, I know only recently, uh, you know, some members of the Chibok community were addressing uh, a statement to the First Lady. I don't know what had brought that about, uh, but they were saying that it's, it's very difficult for them to move on. They cannot move on. Uh, is there now talk around, it's 10 years, the ones that can return or the ones that can be found have, have now been found. I, is it time to have closure on this and move on? That has been our call even uh, before Buhari's government uh, 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 comes to an end. Uh, we asked severally that can we have closure around this issue? You can't have closure without transparency. Yeah, I was going to say, what will closure and mean? And that yeah. the closure, what we are asking about on the closure is, can we have all the committee reports published? Let people know what actually had the committee discovered. What was the true position paper of that committee, the General Sabo Committee? Up to now, many Nigerians don't know anything about that committee. And when Buhari came in and we went to, uh, to protest to the villa, he listened and he addressed us and he promised that he was going to set up a committee that will open up everything around the abduction of Jibo girls. Nothing was heard about that committee again till today. And at the ninth commemoration, we asked question. We said, if the, in the first year of the abduction, there were reports that some girls were killed uh, uh, through snake bites, some died as a result of childbirth, and there were some that were killed by bomb that was dropped on their places of abode by the Nigerian Air Force. And we asked the government, if at all we had girls that escaped, we had those that you negotiated the rescue, first 21 batch, 
and the second 82 bars. All of them are talking. You've debriefed them. You've rehabilitated them and sent them to school. What have they said? Are you saying that they have not disclosed anything? Where they have been to? Those that died? If we had one that died and the girls witnessed their death, why now can't the government now open up and say, okay, so-so person is no more coming back because she's not alive. Get the parents. Why do you Talk think that that's the case? That they're not coming up with information? This is, some came back, I mean, Ali escaped just no, I mean two years governments. after. We don't know. And that is why we are asking the government to be accountable. Because you have the intelligence. You debrief the girls. You kept them in custody and blocked everybody from having access to them for many months. Even as I speak, try to access some of these Chibok girls. You will be met with a lot of brick uh, wall. Because people feel, don't talk. Even in the, those that are in school, no, you don't need to talk. You don't have to talk. Why are you blocking them from talking? Two of the girls become impatient. They open up to their families because, one, it was her, uh, her cousin that died, and she helped in burying her cousin. She told the parents, and the parents had a closure. That was immediately after the rescue of the 21. And now we have 137 rescued girls that have been talking. How many of the Chubo girls that are dead? If we have record of two that are dead now and the parents were informed secretly through their family members that are part of these girls, which means we have two that have closure. Why now can the government release the name of those that are dead? One, this is one of the accountability we are asking for. And then why must you wait as a government until when it is April 14 before you brief the parents? If at all they are actionably intelligent, even from the crude one that is coming out from the girls. You have your military still prosecuting the war on terror. Intelligence is not lacking, which means you have something to tell the parents. And that was why from start Maope, we've been asking the presidency, the Chibok girls' deaths must not be domiciled in the Ministry of Women Affairs. They don't have the political clout to deal with issues like this. And we were not making this noise because we thought it's just Chubok girls. Well, some people are saying it cannot even be true. We were making that, we were struggling to draw the attention of Nigerian government and the security forces and the global community so that we will not be pushed to a level where we have schools, but children cannot go to school because they will have to choose to stay alive now rather than going to school. And that's where we are. Mm. Immediately after Chuba, what happened? Dabchi happened. Why? Because the, these terrorists were emboldened. They feel we can do this and nothing will happen. They came to Dabchi, abducted over 100 students, went away with it, and the talks started. No, we are negotiating. We will bring them back. You allowed terrorists that took girls from school to, to bring them back. Six were marched upon and they died. One was kept behind because she refused to convert. She's a Christian and she refused to convert to Muslim. And you fold your hand, you That's allow the yeah, terrorists sure to still go back. What type of accountability is something, that? Something something is amiss. Are they are the government was the government accountable to the parents of those that died? Was the government accountable to the mother and father of Leah Sharibu? No. And the advocacy continued. Let us not allow this to linger. It will cause another problem. Then Kankara happened. Then Kagara happened. Then the Baptist student happened in Kaduna. Today, in Kaduna alone, we had more than 12 abductions of school children. And now it's widespread. How many? So how long can we be patient with this? It is sending a very, very bad signal of our government. Mm -hmm. Well, right. your, your group is the only group that has, you know, still come up as the only advocacy group that, you know, have advocated for the return of, you know, children that were abducted in a school. I, as, as somebody who's done that, spent a significant part of his life doing that, are you a little still disappointed at the fact that, you know, many Nigerians are still not speaking up as loudly as they can to hold their government accountable? Exactly. I am, because that is the, the big error. 
when you feel it is okay with you because the corpse, the coffin is not at your doorstep and you feel it is happening in the fringes of the northeast, the terrorism, it's not touching you in Abuja, it's not touching you in Lagos, then you are dead wrong. Because how many soldiers died in the process of prosecuting this war on terror? We had Metele, we had Mongono, we had a lot of attack that we lost like hundreds plus soldiers in a day in the Northeast. They might not be all from the Northeast. They may be coming from different places where we are losing soldiers. If we can, if the government can open up to Nigeria on the cost of prosecuting this war on terror, we will be surprised over this period of 10 years plus that we've been fighting war on terror. So it it's, it's affects all of us. So it's high time for everyone to feel uh, it is not okay with me until it's okay with all of us. So we will be on this fight until we get our government accountable. And why we have this complacency and like a discal attitude is because the demand side to governance is not there. Mm -hmm. People feel, uh, no, it's my uncle that, or it's my party that is in power. You don't need to talk now. Just right. as what happened between, you see the, the transition between the good luck's time and Buhari's time. Those that were saying, eh, bring the girls back. It's, 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 it's wrong to have uh, this number of guests abducted. Dr. Manasseh, and, you know, show my, my sincere apologies for butting in. It's actually the basis of the question that I want to ask you. Uh, you know, there are those who are thinking, just as you said, some people are saying it's not true, that it, couldn't, it didn't happen. And it really is unthinkable. 276 children abducted in one day. It's been 3,651 days since that happened. And the question a number of people are asking it, how much of that abduction, which you have also chronicled that has happened severally, more than 6, 1,600 since that time, how much of that is political and how much of it is a security threat? Because you have also spaded the, the political angle of it now. Uh, I, think, I think it's even... Uh... So permit the use of my words. It's even useless to discuss the political uh, type of, of, of abduction. If at all we have the, uh, the anti-terrorism laws in Nigeria that uh, anybody that is sympathetic to terrorism or uh, colluding with terrorists is also a terrorist. So what the government is supposed to do is to ensure that anybody that is against this country by partaking in any kind of abduction should be termed a terrorist and be dealt with by the available laws that we have in Nigeria. So it's not issue of which one is politically motivated. It was because action was not taken. The, the kind of sense of urgency that the Chibok abduction sh should have received was not there. And that was why the terrorists were emboldened. And now we have criminals that feel it's a business that you so, go into a community, abduct children, and demand for ransom. And just just to be clear, Dr. Manasseh, it, just, just a second, my apologies, just to, just to be clear, we had situations where a governor, a sitting governor, went with some security officers of the law, and they took pictures with some of these, you know, people that you call, you know, uh, terrorists and all of that. And we have also had repeatedly one particular person going about and saying, look, I can negotiate on behalf of the federal government with these people. Are you saying those people, as prominent as they are, are you saying they are also terrorists? Um, with all sense of uh, uh, humility, I will tell you that their character is questionable. Very, very questionable. Because if you can have access to terrorists, that are terrorizing Nigeria, what magnitude of information have you provided to the security agencies to take action on them? And by the way, why will, will that even happen? That you have access, and with all the uh, records we have in Nigeria about uh, 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 NIN, uh, BVN, 
uh, phone call matching with, uh, you know, Nin and everything. And we have people making calls, we have people making conversation, and our intelligence community cannot work on it to pin it down. Let me tell you something. What happened with the train attack on Kaduna, on Kaduna Road, uh, uh, the train to Kaduna, when it was attacked and some people were taken? Uh, who, who ordered Tukrumamu to negotiate? And the DSS was there, police were there. Everybody was watching when the negotiations were going on. And people were, you know, lots of money were, were taken from, uh, 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 from people. And it was after the guy left Nigeria that they were chasing him to go and arrest him in Egypt. Where was our intelligence then? So anybody that can access terrorists, I'm not saying that terrorists cannot be accessible. Anybody that can access terrorists, and it is only after the terrorists abducted large number of children from school before you now step in, self-appointed to negotiate, your character is questionable. Okay, well, Dr. Manasse, we, we, we had a, I think it was the Jonathan government, where some officials of government, perhaps even the president himself at the time, saying that he's aware that there were some moles, some Boko Haram um, sympathizers in the government of the day. Perhaps that also may or may not have played the role. That is why I was talking about the political uh, angle to it, because if those sympathizers were there or maybe are still somewhere around now and are still one way or the other influencing things perhaps that is something that that can be considered uh, what is your take on that if you if, uh, do you think they are still as 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 influential so to speak today as they were back then if you can answer that in about 30 seconds the, that's those people those people were already in the government and uh, uh, as it were uh, uh, it, it was true that there were people who are sympathetic to terrorism and they were in government. That was true. Because if you checked one of our protests, especially when the chief of defense staff, the late Alex Bade, announced that there was a ceasefire and uh, they were negotiating the rescue of the Chibok girls and the meeting was in Chad, we questioned it. Why we questioned it was because we were in touch with the Chadian government through the, the, the ambassador of Chad to Nigeria then, Mr. Issa Brahimi. And he said, no, there was no... Uh, negotiation in Chad because if there, w there was negotiation, I should know and my president should know. It wasn't happening. Okay. But well, we had people in government that lied that there was negotiation. Oh dear. So, well, uh, so how many people, it's, it's how many of those children, my apologies, how many of those children still remain unrescued since 2014? We have, we have 82 now uh, that we are we awaiting their return. Is there any conversation, any hope, any update on their status, the, the state of affairs with them as at this time? As at this now, there is no update from any government regarding their status, their location, or anything. But as I said earlier, the girls that were rescued, or the ones that recently escaped, the ones that we are now making noise with the Bono State government to release them, have certain degree of intelligence. That before they left, that particular um, enclave where they, get, they left so so number of girls before they escaped. So if these girls have this kind of crude intelligence, raw as it is, coming from the enclave of Boko Haram, it is only very important for the security agencies to work on the intelligence to ensure that, okay, these ones that are in social location, as reported by these girls, action is taken upon them to get them rescued. It's, it's, it's necessary to do that. So 82 at the moment, that's the figure that, you know, you're expecting. Yes. All right. So, uh, and there's been no communication from the state government or the federal government at that on this matter. On this matter, there is none. The only communication we saw from the state government was the last very annoying news that was coming from Borno when it was reported that the girls that recently escaped of, over this past uh, one year and some months, that have been kept with the Bono State government, that they decided to stay with their captors. And, and, and the news reported the Bono State Minister, Minister or Commissioner of Women Affairs to have said, staying with their husband. So the parents were so angry. And some of us are also very angry that young girls were taken to school. They were abducted under your custody and taken to terrorist den for almost 10 years. And after escaping, instead of you to first line of action, concentrate on their rehabilitation,
concentrate on reuniting them with their families because it's very key in, 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 in psychosocial and trauma healing. You didn't do that. And then you are coming to announce on news that they, have, they are with their husband. It was very annoying. Who collected their bride price? Who officiated the wedding? We said, no, you can't do that because forget about the syndrome that they may come up with. What are the process of their rehabilitation? The girls that, the 21 and the 82 that were rescued, majority of them came back without children. They were kept for so long, almost six months with the government, passing through professional process of rehabilitation. Till today, some of them still have suffered from the trauma of that abduction. What more of the ones that are coming out with two, three children after 10 years? So they have in no way the, in, in the right frame of mind to even define what is right for them. The most important thing for the government to do is remove them completely from this place. Take them to where you can give them professional rehabilitation. Let them heal in presence of their family members. Let them heal in presence of people that they know, yes, the love we are getting now is much more intimate and much more better than the, the sex slavery that we are coming from. So what is your demand right now to the Tinubu administration? My demand to the Tinubu administration is to open everything up about the Chibok girls. One is let us know everything about the report. Two, expedite action. Rescue these girls. It's doable. If they are still running out, coming out to civilization, it's doable to rescue them. Number three, please, all the details of the girls that were said to have been dead, let the Tunubu administration talk to the parents, prepare their minds, and give them the news. Let them have closure. The fourth one is, we have a school that was attacked. And 10 years after, you go to that school and you feel ashamed that the school was rebuilt. It was, at some point, the military engineers were rebuilding the school, according to what uh, Dr. Okonjo Uela told us, you know, uh, uh, before she left. And uh, the military engineer couldn't finish. Borno State government said it was our school. So they stepped in and completed the school. Go to that school and see it. No light for over 10 years. No solar, no water, no laboratory. I was in that school a couple of uh, Sundays ago, and I was talking with some of the staff. And they said, we have lots of students coming to this school because this is the only high All school right. in Chibok. But you don't even have one computer in the school for children to write exams. So over 500 of them lost writing this current jam that, well, that, that, that just passed. So it's pathetic. I guess that, uh, that speaks volumes. So action, you know what it says, speaking louder than words. Well, thank you very much indeed for coming on and for all that you've done and keep doing. Dr. Alan Manasa is a strategic team member of the Bring Back Our Girls movement. Well, that is the show today. We do thank you all for watching. We'll see you next week. I'm Chamberlain Usof. Goodbye. Well, have a good Friday. I'm Mao Pe Ogun Yusuf. And I'm Ayo Makine. Do have a wonderful rest of your day and weekend.